This video is for educational and infotainment purposes only. It is not intended to encourage or glorify the use of illegal drugs, violence, or criminal activity in any way. In the early morning hours of January 5th, after a family holiday party that included his wife, mother, and three daughters, a family home was turned into a battleground. The Mexican military dispatched airplanes, helicopters, and hundreds of soldiers to arrest Ovidio El Raton Guzman, the 32-year-old son of El Chapo and the youngest of Los Chapitos, Little Chapos, who have been in at least partial control of the Sinaloa drug cartel since their father was extradited to the United States in 2017. The raid was in part a response to a $5 million bounty that was placed on his head by the U.S. government, who believes that these men are the main overseers of the fentanyl production and trafficking that has plagued the United States in recent history. So what happened in the raid? Where is Ovidio now? And what does that mean for the future of the Sinaloa drug cartel? Well, you're about to find out. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you are watching Lawyer Up. In today's episode, we will be taking a look at the life and times of Ovidio Guzman from birth until right now in 2023. And to fully understand his life, we have to discuss the history of the Sinaloa drug cartel because you have to really appreciate how it came into existence and evolved over time to truly grasp how Ovidio fits into the organization. In doing so, we will necessarily spend a lot of time talking about his padre, his papa, El Chapo. So you're going to hear a lot of info about different people, El Chapo, El Mayo, the Guadalajara cartel, and its founders, just to name a few. And I have full-length feature videos on about all of those people. So if you are curious about anybody that I mention in this video, you need not look any further than this channel for information. And as with all of my videos, I share them because I love these narco stories. So there is no disrespect intended with any of my comments. Also, I beg your forgiveness because my Spanish is not very good. I'm getting better, but it's still subpar. That being said, I hope you enjoy the video. If you do, hit that like button for me. If you got a comment or a question, you can put it in the comment sections below. And if you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Hit that subscribe button for me now. Ovidio Guzman Lopez was born on March 29th, 1990 in Culiacan, Sinaloa, Mexico. He is the son of Joaquin Archivaldo Guzman Loera. Some know him as El Rapido, and to the world he is known as El Chapo. And mom, Griselda Lopez Perez. Those two would also have three more children together, Edgar Joaquin Jr. and Griselda Guadalupe. Now, it is unclear how many half-siblings Ovidio has from his father's side, as El Chapo has married at least four times and is believed to have fathered as many as 15 children. But of relevance, besides for Ovidio and Joaquin Jr., we know that a couple of El Chapo's other sons, namely Ivan Archivaldo Guzman Salazar and Jesus Alfredo Guzman, are also involved in the drug trafficking business with the group collectively known as Los Chapitos or the Little Chapos. Now, before we get into the life and times of Ovidio Guzman, to really understand his story, a little cartel history is in order. So come with me back to the mid-70s, 
where there were a lot of marijuana and heroin manufacturing and distribution groups called plazas in Mexico. And the name of the game was to get the drugs to the United States because gringos pay top dollar for the stuff. So naturally, these plazas fought amongst themselves and they killed each other over territories and drug routes and whatnot. That was until three men came along and convinced these warring factions to band together to work for the common good. Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, Ernesto Fonseco Carrillo, Don Neto, and Rafael Caro Quintero, Rafa, would coordinate the various plazas, their production and operations, to form the core of what became known as the Guadalajara Cartel. Their combined forces, this group took slinging dope to the next level. First, they started producing high-quality seedless marijuana called Sensamia in mass quantities from large, and I mean large, multi-acre fields. And really, nobody in history had produced marijuana on this scale before. And it was also about this time, 1980 or so, that the Colombian drug cartels began to utilize Mexico as a transshipment point for their cocaine. And so the GC started working with somebody else you may have heard of, one Pablo Escobar and the Medellin drug cartel, assisting with trafficking boatloads of cocaine from Colombia to Mexico. So drug trafficking in the 80s in North America was dominated by the Guadalajara cartel, who saw future legendary traffickers like El Chapo and a guy by the name of Ismael Zimbada Garcia, or El Mayo, moving up within the organization. And life was good with the Guadalajara cartel. Really good. At its peak, it was estimated to be worth at over a billion dollars. And by unifying these plazas, the Guadalajara cartel was able to protect their trade primarily with money and bribes rather than bullets, as much of what they were doing was being protected by local law enforcement and politicians. But then came the fly in the ointment that caused the whole thing to come crashing down. U.S. DEA agent Kiki Camarena. Now, I'm not going to go into all of the details of Kiki's story, as I have a full-length video on this channel that you can check out. But in November of 1984, he spearheaded an effort that busted two huge GC marijuana plantations that had an estimated annual production in the billions of dollars. This was an unbelievable blow to the Guadalajara cartel. So, needless to say, certain members of the GC made preparations to deal with Kiki. And on February 7th of 1985, Camarena was abducted in broad daylight, taken to a cartel mansion, and there he was beaten, tortured, and murdered. Camarena's murder then prompted a swift reaction from the United States DEA, which launched Operation Leyenda, or Legend, the largest DEA homicide investigation ever undertaken, with the three leaders of the GC as the primary suspects. Rafa and Don Neto were arrested within a couple of months, but Felix Gallardo, he was able to evade arrest for another four years. However, on April 8th of 1989, the last of the GC founders was taken into custody. With the big three behind bars, the GC decided it would be more efficient and less likely to be disrupted by law enforcement if they diversified. In a meeting set up by Gallardo's lawyer, several of the top narcos in Mexico met in 1989 at a house in Acapulco where they divided up the territories. The Tijuana route would go to Gallardo's nephews, the Ariano Felix brothers. The Juarez route would stay with the Carrillo Fuentes family, namely Amado, and that was Don Neto's bunch. Miguel Caro Quintero would run the Sonora Corridor, that being Rafa's family, and Joaquin Guzman, El Chapo, and Hector Luis Palma were left with the Sinaloa and the Pacific Coast operations, with El Mayo eventually joining them. So, the world of drug trafficking within the Guadalajara cartel went from one group to four groups, the Tijuana, 
the Sonora, the Juarez, and the Sinaloa. So it's 1990, and two important things just happened. El Chapo became a leader of his own drug cartel, and baby Ovidio Guzman, who is the subject of this video, was born. So as Ovidio is learning to walk, El Chapo is learning to utilize drug corridors and border crossings in Tijuana, Tecate, Mexicali, and San Luis, Rio, Colorado, which if you are not familiar with the Mexico side of the border, that basically runs between San Diego, California, and Yuma, Arizona. And while the Guadalajara cartel had trafficked most of its drugs over land, El Chapo built a sophisticated tunnel system from Mexico under the border right into the United States through which he moved millions of dollars of drugs. And these were sophisticated tunnels. They were deep. They had electricity, lighting, often ventilated, and some of them had rails upon which motorized vehicles could transport contraband and personnel. And simply put, because of their logistics superiority, the Sinaloa cartel was just trafficking better than everybody else. They were moving a lot more dope and getting a much larger slice of the money pie than the other three cartel groups. So there began to fester some envy and some anger with the other groups, especially with the Tijuana cartel. And in 1992, the Tijuana cartel would get the violence ball rolling by executing Armando Lopez, who was El Chapo's right-hand man. This was a slight that El Chapo might have overlooked. But then the Ariano Felix brothers hired a hitman to go after his longtime partner Hector Palma's family, killing his wife and two of his children. And at that point, it was on. And so this was really the end of the era where money and bribes was used to protect the drug cartels and is really when things started to bend towards the violence that we see in the Mexican drug trade today. Now, I walk through the entire story of what happened next in my full-length videos on El Chapo, and it's fascinating. But for the purposes of this story, all you really need to know is that over the next year, the Tijuana Cartel and the Sinaloa Cartel took turns trying to assassinate each other's leaders. This continued until May 24th of 1993, when Cardinal and Archbishop Juan Jesus Posados Ocampo was killed in a failed assassination attempt on El Chapo's life. Well, that crossed a line. The incident outraged the Mexican police, politicians, the Catholic Church, and the public in general. In response, the government launched a massive manhunt and offered a multi-million dollar bounty on those involved. And although he was technically a victim in the attack, El Chapo's picture was plastered across every newspaper and TV in North America. So exposed in Mexico, El Chapo bounced across the border to Guatemala where he would ultimately be arrested a short time later on June 9th of 1993. And little Ovidio, well, he was three at the time of his father's arrest. And from there, long story short, El Chapo was extradited back to Mexico, where he was charged and convicted of drug trafficking and sentenced to 20 years in prison. Even though El Chapo was in prison, the Sinaloa cartel continued to operate as his brother, Ovidio's uncle, Arturo Guzman, stepped in and assumed a leadership role alongside Hector Palma and El Mayo. Those three would head up the cartel over the next three years until Palma was arrested in 1995 by the Mexican army. Then it was just Arturo, who was standing in for El Chapo, and El Mayo as the two in charge of the cartel. So, it's 1995. Ovidio is now five and starting elementary school at the prestigious school run by the Legionnaires of Christ in Mexico City. The problem was that everybody knew who he was, or more importantly, who his father was. And quite frankly, the other families were afraid of the potential for violence. So, Ovidio didn't get invited to sleepovers or birthday parties or the other things that kids 
traditionally get to do. This exclusion came to a head when a large group from the school was going to Disney World for a trip. Well, Ovidio was being left out, so his mama got involved and actually offered to pay for the entire trip for all of the students if Ovidio could go along. Well, they declined, and so mama yanked him out of the school in the sixth grade in what would be the end of his institutionalized education. This occurred in 2001, the same year another significant event happened, a prison break. Even though El Chapo had been in prison for the last seven years, he was still heavily involved in the cartel dealings. And as it turned out, he had most of the guards in the prison on his payroll. So on January 19th of 2001, in a group effort orchestrated and paid for by the Sinaloa cartel and executed internally through corrupt corrections officials, El Chapo was loaded into a laundry cart and rolled right out the front door of the prison. Escaped. And within a couple of days, El Chapo was back in charge of the Sinaloa cartel, along with El Mayo, where he was reunited with his son, Ovidio, now aged 11. Of relevance on the cartel side of things, it was at this point that El Chapo decided to expand their drug market and they started manufacturing methamphetamine. Chapo would also expand their entry points into the United States by partnering with the Juarez cartel to gain access to crossings in Texas as well. Now, that joint venture lasted until September 11th of 2004, when, after a perceived slight, El Chapo allegedly ordered the assassination of the leader of the Juarez cartel, Rodolfo Carrillo Fuentes. This, of course, set into motion a bloody battle between those two cartels that continues, well, to this day, really. So it's 2004. Ovidio is 14 and getting his very first taste of the drug cartel world as El Chapo would remain at the head of the Sinaloa cartel along with El Mayo over the next four years. The next major event would occur in 2008 when El Chapo allegedly made a deal with the DEA wherein he intentionally gave up some of his own cartel leaders including Alfredo Beltran Leva, in exchange for continued operations free from arrest. This obviously didn't sit too well with the other Beltran Leva brothers, who were also lieutenants in the Sinaloa cartel. So they broke off and they started their own syndicate in 2008. As for Ovidio, he was now 18 and, along with some of his brothers, kind of stepped into the lieutenant roles that had been vacated by the Beltran Levas when they departed. And two years later, in 2010, Ovidio would become a father with the birth of his first baby girl. The first shout out is to our presenting sponsor, Skillshare, the online learning community with instructional videos from industry leaders on just about any topic you can imagine. These are how-to videos focused on completing a specific project rather than just general information. It's practical learning on topics of your choice at your pace. Skillshare. Check out the link in the description below. During his time on the lam, Chapo primarily hid out in the Sierra Madre Mountains in the Triangulo Dorado or the Golden Triangle region of Mexico between Sinaloa, Durango, and Chihuahua. And had he stayed hidden in that region, who knows? But he didn't. And his luck ran out when authorities tracked El Chapo to a beachfront hotel in Mazatlan and arrested him on February 22nd of 2014. He was taken into custody after a brief struggle. He'd been on the lam for 13 years. Ovidio was 24 at the time of this arrest. So El Chapo was taken back to prison. This time he was put in solitary confinement in a highly restricted cell where he stayed 23 hours a day. He was under 24-7 security camera surveillance in every area of his cell except for the shower. El Chapo faced charges in several Mexican and United States courts 
for murder and kidnapping and torture, drug trafficking, money laundering, you name it, he was charged with it. And so while the legal wranglings were taking place with El Chapo, in his absence, Los Chapitos, his sons, stepped back into a primary leadership role within the Sinaloa cartel. And that's where things stood until July 11th of 2015. It was on that day when the corrections official who was monitoring El Chapo's camera feed noted that he entered the shower area but had not exited for over 25 minutes. Guards were dispatched to investigate, and what they found when they arrived at his cell was a great big hole in the shower floor and a ladder descending into the depths. But no El Chapo. So here's how he escaped the second time. There was a tunnel that was chiseled out about 33 feet underground. It spanned right at a mile to a house that was under construction nearby. The tunnel was five feet, seven inches tall and two and a half feet wide. It had lighting, air ducts and a motorcycle on rails for a fast getaway. So by July of 2015, Ovidio, now aged 25, is again reunited with his dad. Interestingly, right after the escape, Ovidio's mother, Griselda Lopez Perez, would be arrested for, quote, her role in operations of El Chapo's DTO, Drug Trafficking Organization. However, it appears that it was more of a publicity stunt than anything else, as she was set free the same day she was arrested after a federal judge decided that there was not enough evidence to warrant her detention. Interesting. Then what happened next has to be categorized in the truth is stranger than fiction category. So El Chapo, back with the Sinaloa cartel, reaches out to Mexican actress Kate de Castillo, telling her he would like to talk to her about doing a Hollywood film on his life. She agrees and gets into contact with American actor Sean Penn. Yeah, the one that was married to Madonna. And they decide that they would start the process with an interview of El Chapo. So on October 2nd of 2015, De Castillo and Penn travel to a mountaintop location in the Sierra Madres where they conduct an interview that would later be published in the Rolling Stone magazine. And in that article, El Chapo tells his story, including that he supplied more heroin, meth, cocaine, and marijuana than anybody else in the world. It's hotly disputed as to whether this meeting actually led authorities to El Chapo's hidden location. Regardless, within a couple of months, Mexican special forces nabbed El Chapo in Operation Black Swan. The day was January 8th of 2016, about six months after his second escape. This would be the last day that El Chapo would walk the earth as a free man. From there, and it took a bit, but El Chapo was ultimately extradited to the United States, tried in a New York federal court, found guilty of all charges, and sentenced to life in prison plus 30 years. El Chapo is currently serving his sentence at the ADX Supermax Prison in Florence, Colorado. This is the nation's new Alcatraz. It's considered the most secure prison in the United States, if not the world. So from 2016 forward, a video and his brothers would take a more prominent role as leaders of the Sinaloa cartel because there was really no hope that El Chapo was going to return after his extradition to the United States. And when it comes to Los Chapitos, there is much dispute as to which son actually has the most control. His older brothers, Ivan and Jesus, are generally considered more powerful than Ovidio or Joaquin. But without question, Ovidio was an important leader. In 2016, he also had something else happen that was significant in his life. Ovidio's second daughter would be born. So by 2017, you have the Sinaloa cartel being run by Los Chapitos and El Mayo. And now that El Chapo was gone for good, Los Chapitos was getting a little more comfortable in the co-pilot's chair. And this caused friction 
because the two sides really had very different philosophies on how you act as a leader of a drug cartel. El Mayo, well, he lays low, which is why he has never set foot in a prison after all of these years. Los Chapitos, they are more ambitious and known to show off their wealth and be far more visible. In addition, after the permanent loss of El Chapo, another fracture emerged within the cartel as Damaso Lopez, El Licenciado, the graduate, Another high-ranking cartel boss, probably most famous for orchestrating El Chapo's first prison escape, he also started eyeing the top position. So then there were three factions vying for control. So in 2017, Damaso organizes a meeting between himself and El Mayo and Los Chapitos to address the future leadership of the Sinaloa cartel. Los Chapitos and El Mayo, they arrive on time, but Damaso is nowhere to be found. When all of a sudden an SUV comes speeding up and starts firing at the house where the traffickers had gathered inside. It was a trap, allegedly set up by Damaso, who was playing for control of the whole Sinaloa cartel. Well, the attack failed. Failed to kill El Mayo, failed to kill Los Chapitos, and eventually Damaso was tracked down by police and arrested. So his short-term attempt at control was ultimately unsuccessful. Also in 2017, in response to his ascension in power, the United States formally indicted both Ovidio Guzman and his younger brother Joaquin on charges of participating in a conspiracy to traffic cocaine, methamphetamine, and marijuana. The indictment included allegations that the brothers had been overseeing approximately 11 methamphetamine labs in the state of Sinaloa, producing an estimated 3,000 to 5,000 pounds of methamphetamine per month. There were also allegations that Ovidio had ordered the murder of other drug traffickers, informants, and a Mexican singer who had refused to sing at his wedding. Again, these are only allegations, and Ovidio is presumed innocent until proven guilty. Anyway, it was at this point that the U.S. Department of Justice offered a reward of $5 million for information leading to the arrest of Ovidio Guzman. In addition, it is believed that somewhere just prior to this time period, he married his longtime girlfriend, Adriana Meza Torres, the daughter of LM6, a cartel member who was killed a decade earlier. During 2018, the division between Los Chapitos and El Mayo continued to widen. And then it took center stage in October of 2019 when a large convoy of Mexican National Guard vehicles drove up to a house owned by Ovidio Guzman in Culiacan. They were there to serve an extradition warrant from a U.S. judge. And the military succeeded in taking Ovidio into custody. But quickly, they found themselves surrounded by cartel enforcers in what is now referred to as the infamous Battle of Culiacan, or Culiacan Nasso. What happened was that after his arrest, about 700 cartel gunmen began to attack civilian, government, and military targets around the city. Massive towers of smoke could be seen rising from burning cars and vehicles. The cartel gunmen were equipped with armored vehicles, bulletproof vests, 50 caliber rifles, grenade launchers, and heavy machine guns. In truth, they had the Mexican military significantly outmanned and outgunned. In the end, a video was actually released by the military after the cartel took multiple hostages, including eight servicemen and a housing unit where military families lived in Culiacan. The Mexican president would later defend his decision to release Ovidio, arguing, quote, it prevented further loss of life and the capture of one drug smuggler was not more valuable than the life of innocent civilians. End quote. So externally, Culiacan Nasso was a Sinaloa cartel victory due to the massive turnout of cartel enforcers, which freed Ovidio. Internally, well, that was a different story 
because El Mayo had held his gunmen back and they did not participate in the rescue of Ovidio. As you might suspect, this did not go unnoticed and it put a permanent wedge in the relationship between Los Chapitos and El Mayo as they believed he had, quote, turned his back on them in their time of need. Regardless, after Culiacan Nasso, Ovidio shot to fame with photos of the defiant young narco going viral. And in 2019, another significant thing happened. Ovidio's third baby girl was born. So if you're keeping score at home, it's 2019. Ovidio is 29. His wife, Adriana, is 28. And they have three children, all girls, ages nine, three. And the couple had just had a brand new baby. After his close call with the authorities, moving forward, Ovidio lived in fear of rearrest, constantly moving himself and his family between several houses he owned in Culiacan and in nearby towns. This all according to sources inside of the Mexican army. Of particular significance is a collection of houses he owns in a compound in the city of Jesus Maria Sinaloa, a tiny town about 40 minutes outside of the capital city of Culiacan. So there's basically only one way in and out of Jesus Maria. It is a highway that runs from Culiacan. As you approach the edge of town, there is a stone arch welcoming visitors to Jesus Maria, but it also marks the beginning of cartel-held country. When Ovidio was in town, the entrance would be flanked on either side by cartel punteros, or lookouts, there to raise the alarm of an unknown vehicle passed through. Locals would say that Ovidio generally had over a hundred lookouts on the job and several checkpoints along the way in. His sicarios would also watch 24 seven outside of the wooden gates of his compound, normally sitting atop armored vehicles with mounted machine guns. Notice the mouse above the Punisher logo on one of these vehicles. That's for Ovidio's nickname, El Raton, the mouse. Guzman's home itself is purchased atop a hill. The vantage point allows cartel men to spot the approach of rival cartels or law enforcement. And make no mistake about it, this compound stands out. The houses surrounding it are one or two bedroom homes with sheet metal roofs and dirt floors. This is an area of extreme poverty, which you might think would lead to resentment as to Ovidio's wealth. However, as it turns out, Ovidio was very popular with the locals in Jesus Maria. Some described him as a hero, others as a grandson. Most of the residents said that for years they received financial support from him while the Mexican government had abandoned them. So his presence was welcomed in this small community. Second shout out today is to Liquid IV, the electrolyte drink mix that delivers hydration to your cells faster than just drinking water alone. This hydration and energy multiplier is way better than Gatorade. Make your water work harder. Give it a try today. The link to order is in the description below. Let's jump to December of 2022. More than three years has passed since the government first tried to capture El Raton at Culiacan Nasso. Military surveillance would reveal that Ovidio had been staying separate from his family during Christmas. But in late December, several men began preparing the compound in Jesus Maria for his arrival. Locals reported that Ovidio arrived around the 1st of January and then had his family brought in on January 4th of 2023 for a late holiday reunion. Ultimately, Ovidio, his wife, and his three daughters, as well as his mother, Griselda Lopez Perez, would all gather at the home. According to a neighbor, they hired a cook, a mariachi band, and waiters to serve at the night's gathering and sat around enjoying drinks and food as the kids opened their Christmas gifts. The neighbor reported that the celebration lasted well into the night with the sounds of the party finally quieting after midnight. Little did they know that their night of fun and celebration was about to be shattered. 
And despite having over 100 men working for him on the night of the raid, Guzman's men did not foresee what was going to happen next. A few minutes before 4 a.m. on January 5th, 2023, the Mexican military deployed several aircraft, including one that drops soldiers in and around the compound and a helicopter gunship that fired upon the cluster of homes that makes up Ovidio's compound in Jesus Maria. The military, apparently learning a lesson from Culiacanazo, decided that instead of rolling up to his mansion in vehicles in broad daylight, they would drop in with helicopters right on top of him in the dead of night. And in doing so, they avoided tipping off the lookouts and gunmen along the route and maintained the element of surprise. So the gunship and the soldiers open fire. They riddle the massive wooden double doors that guarded the entrance with hundreds of bullets. Cartel gunmen responded by returning fire at the invaders. Others spread out and started burning vehicles and setting up roadblocks in an effort to block the authorities' ability to transport Ovidio out of the area. There is disagreement as to whether Ovidio was captured at his home or elsewhere. Original reports were that soldiers entered the home and took him into custody in the first 10 minutes of the raid. But that doesn't seem to be what actually happened, as forces would battle for more than 10 hours in and around his compound, leaving dozens dead and laying waste to the town of Jesus Maria. So the other report was that after the raid began, Ovidio fled and a military surveillance team picked up an armored caravan of trucks leaving the area that they surmised was Ovidio's entourage. So as they surrounded the vehicles, the military came under fire from the cartel. Now, during the firefight, Ovidio was positively identified as one of the occupants. This time, however, the military had greater numbers and firepower and ultimately took Ovidio into custody at 6.20 a.m. on the morning of January 5th, 2023. So as the sun rose, the people of Culiacan woke to see their city in flames as the hashtag Ovidio Guzman began trending heavily. His cartel men had retaliated, just like last time. They set vehicles on fire and used them to block streets and highways, creating nearly 20 separate roadblocks meant to prohibit the transfer of Ovidio out of the city. They also engaged in attacks and shootings in and around the city. Both the mayor of Culiacan and the governor of Sinaloa would instruct residents to shelter in place as information circulated that Ovidio was being transported by plane to Mexico City, about 750 miles to the south. So, cartel operatives hit the local airports, and at around 10 a.m., attacks were reported at both the Culiacan International Airport as well as another local military airfield. A commercial airliner was actually caught in the crossfire that morning with passengers sheltering beneath their seats and in the aisles during the ordeal. As it turned out, the military aircraft that transported Ovidio didn't take off from either airport, but instead left directly from the point of arrest. It would arrive in Mexico City later that morning. Throughout the balance of the day, cartel members would continue their assault on the city, attempting to prevent the removal of their kingpin. Little did they know, he was already long gone. Reports of the arrest were later confirmed by the defense secretary, who stated that personnel from all branches of its military worked together to capture Ovidio and successfully transport him to jail. He is currently being held at the Federal Social Readaptation Center No. 1, Altiplano, a maximum security federal prison outside of Mexico City. This, coincidentally, is the same prison that his father, El Chapo, escaped from back in 2015. So, a little nostalgia there. The government reported that the operation was six months in the planning and that it utilized over 3,500 soldiers in the operation to arrest one man. It's crazy. 
It also reported that 10 soldiers, 19 gang members, and one police officer were killed during the unrest. 25 additional suspected cartel members were also taken into custody during the operation. And while the official death toll was around 30 in the raid, local residents say that the real death toll is much higher. In fact, residents of Jesus Maria say the government is covering up mass casualties and went turned out to be a 10-hour gunfight. Some are saying that the government actually took several individuals killed in the crossfire with them on a helicopter to hide the bodies. Quote, there are currently more than 140 people missing from Jesus Maria that the government is not acknowledging. End quote. This was from a local resident who asked that their name be withheld because of fear of retaliation from the government. He went on to say, quote, we need to recover those bodies, end quote. Indeed. Interestingly, a reporter from Vice News actually went to the location and ventured inside of Ovidio's compound about a week after the raid. Through this, we learned that the house has some interesting features, such as a large circular bathtub, a walk-in closet bigger than most of the homes in the area, and a state-of-the-art kitchen. It also had some strange things like a life-size nativity scene in the backyard. But that's all destroyed now. What the vice reporter documented was devastation wrought from the military raid and the exchange of gunfire. The living room was ransacked. High-end furniture made out of mahogany and marble strewn about, including two white couches turned upside down and darkened with blood. The home's walls were littered with bullet holes, shell casings covering the floor. A huge panoramic window looking out on the lush Sinaloa Mountains was turned into a ragged hole with shattered glass strewn about the complex. The reporter stated that Ovidio's bedroom, dark due to its blackout blinds, quote, now smells of gunpowder and stale blood with a large blood stain marring the white bed sheets. Ovidio's vehicles kept nearby in the garage, a white armored GLE Mercedes Benz and a black armored G-Wagon were shot up with high caliber rounds. Interestingly, like El Chapo, Ovidio had an escape tunnel leading from his garage area to outside of the compound. As you can see, the entrance to the tunnel is normally disguised as a part of the cement floor and is only made visible when the lid is pulled back, revealing a chute that is intended to be an escape route if needed. Accounts are disputed as to whether Ovidio actually used this escape route to exit the home once the raid began, but it appears that he may have done so, and then the cartel members tried to hide the hatch by putting blankets and clothes on it. Outside of the compound, the vice reporter said that he saw a number of unexploded grenades just lying on the ground. Locals said that they'd left the grenades alone in the hopes that the Mexican army would come back and remove them. Several of the neighboring houses were perforated by bullet holes during the exchange. Alfredo, a local resident, said that the bullets from that day destroyed his only car, which he used to take his sick wife to Culiacan for medical help every week. Alfredo went on to say, quote, Honestly, I really hope he will be freed. He helped us a lot with medical bills, with money, with whatever we needed. Alfredo would say, we want him here. He is loved by everyone in town, everyone. So with Ovidio's arrest, where does that leave the Sinaloa cartel today? Well, most experts don't believe it will affect the cartel's operation at all. First and foremost, within Los Chapitos, the primary leadership of Ivan and Jesus remains intact, but that's just one faction. You also have El Mayo's bunch, Although rumor has it that El Mayo is actually no longer involved in the day-to-day -day operations due to his age and complications from his diabetes. Instead, one of his sons, who goes by Maito Flacco, is rumored to be his heir apparent, as another son, Maito Gordo, was arrested and extradited to the United States. And then there is Ariliano Guzman, a.k.a. El Guano, that's El Chapo's brother, who has his own faction. 
So the Sinaloa cartel is still very much alive. And while the arrest of Ovidio was high profile, most experts believe it will have no effect on stemming the tide of illicit drugs coming into the United States. As for the future of Ovidio Guzman, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. He is facing charges in Mexico, and there is an extradition request for Ovidio to face charges also in the United States. And if his father's extradition process was any indication, both countries are in for a long wait as they seek to bring him to justice. So make sure you subscribe to the channel so you can follow along as the case proceeds through the courts. So that's the episode. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, hit that like button for me. If you got a comment, you have a question, put it in the comment sections below. Adios for now. My name is Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you've been watching Lawyer Up.